Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn with Focus Compounding, on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all our content that we push out into the investing universe. Uh, the best way to do that is to follow me on X, formerly known as Twitter, at, at Focus Compound. Uh, go to focuscompound.com to get access to investment write-ups from Jeff going all the way back to 2005. If you go to Google and type in the Gannon compilation, you should be able uh, to pull up a compiled uh, version of that. Everything Jeff has written in the public domain, for the most part, that's on Focus Compounding, um, uh, all in one document. It's got, I believe, over a million words. Uh, you can get access to it and you can download it to your computer. I use it all the time. Control F, there's certain topics, and it's a great resource for investors. Uh, if you're interested in learning about our money management services, you can reach out to me at andrew at focuscompound.com or go to the invest with us tab on our website uh, to get access to that. So today's podcast, Jeff, we're going to talk about capital allocation. I put out a tweet saying that um, we're recording a podcast all about capital allocation, which is, of course, one of the most important ways that public companies can serve their shareholders. And I asked for questions of, you know, what are some individual questions that people have as it relates to capital allocation? I think that's a great format uh, to do going forward for certain topics is when we come up with a particular topic, tweet it out just like this, crowdsource it, um, and see what's on everybody's mind as it relates to capital allocation. Uh, but before we jump into that, Maybe just give us a overview, Jeff, of how you see capital allocation, right? We said for companies to be able to serve their shareholders, what does that mean? What does capital allocation mean to you? Um, I think capital allocation from your perspective of a portfolio manager could be different from a company's perspective if they're, they're just focusing on their company, maybe. Uh, but I really want to talk about the difference in capital allocation from like the Buffett partnership years and how that's changed over the years. And just get your thoughts on capital allocation. What does capital allocation mean to you? Well, the main idea is that if the company earns a dollar, keeps a dollar, uh, it creates a dollar for shareholders. So you can give them the money and they have to pay taxes on that in the United States. Um, and they get what's left over after that. If you keep the money, then over time, the stock should go up by as much as the amount that you keep, right? So if you make $5 a share, that should cause the stock to go up $5 over time. If you keep all that, don't pay anything of a dividend. If you pay it all out in a dividend, then your stock should stay flat, not go down. You don't want a situation where the company earns a lot of money over time, but it doesn't cause the stock price to go up a lot over time. So it's just about making sure that, you know, you're good stewards of the capital, as Buffett would say, that it benefits the owners and not just managers or um that it doesn't get wasted in between. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the retain the Buffett test, basically, mm -hmm. which we've talked about before in the past. Yeah, there's no other way to really do it. Because for some companies, it's going to be that the best answer is dividends and free uh, and um, generate from free cash flow, things like that. For other companies that might be to grow all the time, acquire other things, own assets, you know, it could be anything, it's just to benefit the owners, but what the owners own could be totally different. So I don't think there's any one test that should be about anything else other than the return over time. And even when we say the Buffett test, that's for the stuff that they retain. It works well for Berkshire that doesn't pay out dividends, but other companies could pay out dividends instead of retaining. Mm -hmm. What was it? I mean, we've spoken about Buffett and Berkshire in the earlier days. I mean, really what he did was capital reallocation, right? took capital yeah. from a failing uh, business and reallocated it into things that uh, obviously were better than a failing textile mill. That's the genius of what Buffett did in the earlier days, correct? Yeah. And that's usually the easiest thing to do, I would say, is that reducing the amount of capital that you have in businesses that aren't as good is the best way to increase your returns on capital, right? Because what matters is return on capital. Finding new things to put 
um, capital into that have high returns is often harder than looking at the things that are below average and taking those out. So increasing the average of the overall enterprise by trimming the stuff that isn't as good is usually easier. Um, you know, there's other situations where that's um, there are opportunities to get add above average stuff, but usually companies start by thinking, oh, we need to make decisions to add above average returns on capital instead of asking, well, where do we have capital that is earning below average returns? Let's take that out and we'll raise the overall average. It's sort of like um, you could add an amazing player to a team where you have eight um, players on the, the team, uh, batters, and uh, but you, the next one you add would have to be amazing. Or you could ask which of the nine that I already have is really lousy. Can I replace him with someone who's just average? That's usually there are more choices to be able to do that, right? To bring up the average of the lineup. Um, but you could also do it by finding Babe Ruth or something and adding that to an already great set of eight players. It's just harder. So it's easier to find what's the weak link and fix that first mm -hmm. um, than it is to, to do the opposite. So that's the thing I think often gets overlooked when we talk about net nets. That's often how net nets get fixed is not that they do amazing things after that, but that they reduce the amount of capital in the business. Buffett reduced the amount of capital in textiles. Mm -hmm. Why do you think most companies don't think like that? Well, I don't know if most companies think that their return on capital is going to determine their stock returns over time. Um, and I do think that most companies start from the perspective of budgeting based on last year's budgets and um, capital being allocated based on how it's already allocated. So they don't reassess it regularly. Um, so I think that's usually the answer is that their baseline is what the situation already is. Um, and then also it's difficult to take things out of a business sometimes, um, psychologically, um, for the institution and everything. And it's easy to uh, just allocate more money to stuff. Um, the other thing also is that sometimes projections are better, consistently better than, uh, actual realized results. And so you could always come up with a projection that justifies investment, even though the actual results have never justified in the past. Mm-hmm. How has capital allocation changed over the years? Like you think back to Buffett's earlier days and how, um, you know, the corporation thought about capital allocation. Can you give us a history lesson on how things have changed throughout the years and why? Sure. So debt has gone up a lot and dividends have gone down a lot, I would say, are the big things. So more stuff has gone to debt service. And then you have the dividend situation changing for public companies. I think you also have a big change is the venture capital and all of that stuff. So you have longer phases in which um, private companies are financed by others and public companies can have losses that are financed by still having a good stock price if they promise good things in the future. Um, and in the past, that used to be done a lot through the taking the cash flows from a successful business and putting it into a new area um, and financing it internally. And now it doesn't have to be done that way. Right. So like um, you could raise money to do open AI or something without having to do it inside of an Apple or a, a Microsoft mm -hmm. or something, whereas in the past, that's not what happened. So no one would give you money to start up a money losing TV network or something, but someone who already owned money making radio stations would say let's also get in the tv business right let's also get in the cable business when that's losing money that's also each step of the way instead of raising money for an all-new venture but that's changed because of venture capital mm -hmm. what about just companies chasing growth for growth's sake right buffett as you had said that really the only thing that matters is the return on capital and sometimes people look at growth like uh from like a sales perspective well now they're doing more on the top line but you know mm -hmm. the profits have deteriorated, or their their return on capital has deteriorated. What is that? Is that like the institutional imperative that Buffett always talks about that leads companies to doing that? The size, is it ego? What do you think that is? That's possible. It's also what they measure instead of um, measuring other things. I mean, if you asked a manager what their sales are and what their sales growth are, or shrinking from year to year, as they know that they probably don't know a lot about their return on capital. Um, but that's been a feature for American business for 
a long time and it's been i'd say even more so was the case from the 40s through the 80s or something or 70s um than it has been today there's much more focus on things like cash flow and return on capital now than there used to be um mm -hmm. yeah uh, in terms of like how many people allocate capital like buffett does or something it may have been more common at one time for like founders and people who control companies and who weren't professional management back in the 1800s to the early 1900s. But among professional managers, it's not been a very common focus to be that worried about return on capital and um, the returns that you're getting in the stock over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, I don't know, can you think of other interesting managers that follow this approach to capital allocation, similar to Tom Murphy, Henry Singleton, Warren Buffett, um, these guys that are just super thoughtful in how they go about things. I mean, Buffett financing paper at nothing, going and buying a bunch of Japanese stocks in more recent times. I mean, brilliant, obviously, right? Um, I love how Henry Singleton would acquire a bunch of companies using stock with his expensive currency stock, but then he's also not afraid to, you know, gobble up all the shares when it's trading at a single digit PE. Tom Murphy, as we read about the other day, he bought back like 50% at one point as well. Why is it that we just don't see that as much in today's markets? Um, I mean, I, the, the book, The Outsiders, covers, I guess, eight cases. It doesn't cover some other ones, but you could guess that other things they'd cover if it was written up to the present would be Trans Diamond Constellation mm -hmm. um, software. Uh, there's also... Um, the author of that book has been involved just sitting on boards and stuff with a couple companies, I guess. And so um, you could also look him up and see what those companies are. Um, and that would also give you a hint of what kinds of things are focused on that kind of capital allocation. Um, I think you've mentioned before outright references to the outsiders, or if not to the outsiders, then at least to metrics and things that are similar at like, um, uh, Ricks, right? Um, that's one stock that has done that. RCI Hospitality, whatever. Did it rename it to Ricks? Yeah, I mean, I just Rick is what I think everyone knows that yeah. as RCI okay. Hospitality. Yeah, but no, that's an, a, yeah. a perfect example. Which we're not uh, the fund or manage accounts, not that owns um, mm -hmm. Ricks, but from watching on the outside, I mean, yeah, like they do have a framework that they seem to follow um, buying companies and then when their stock trades at a certain uh free cash flow yield they turn the buyback machine on and they buy it and it seems like he thinks about that and um that framework came from the outsiders and he's effectively communicated that to the market i think most people that follow that company know that that's what they uh are setting out to do yeah yeah and i know that we talked to a ceo who said that some shareholders of his like send him the outsiders and we're like read this and stuff so yeah um you know and he said actually it wasn't bad and stuff you know it, mm -hmm. that it, it made a lot of sense so yeah um that you know uh that does happen um I, I think in the modern thing many of these people have backgrounds in private equity stuff in some way or another that we see do this um not exclusively but that's more often what we see when we see unusual capital allocation of the type we're talking about and that makes sense too because remember buffett was an investor and everything so um yeah i guess some of the malone had already written a thesis basically thinking about how to optimize uh economic efficiency under conditions of a monopoly and cable would only be a local monopoly um but still that's a capital intensive monopoly that was he had basically thought out those things already so consulting some people come from consulting backgrounds some people from private equity that seems to be mostly what we're getting mm-hmm so the first question we get on capital allocation comes from The Rational Walk. It seems like variable dividends should be much more common than regular quarterly dividends, except for companies with very stable and predictable free cash flow. This would prevent irrational decisions to maintain or slightly increase dividends annually. Curious if you guys agree with that. Yeah, I do agree with it, but I don't think it's going to happen. Um, there's some evidence that there's more special dividends and stuff lately, I think. So that's one hope. But yeah, it would make a lot of sense. I think it'd be better from a credit perspective too. Um, but no one ever wants to cut the dividend. And we've even had people mention to us. I mean, I think someone said to us like, you know, 
it would be nice if we could raise it a little bit every year. If we just do another 10 years or something, we'll be have done it 25 years in a row. And then, you know, there's no reason why we can't do it 50 and it's something for the company to aspire to. So, um, that I, I just think that that's, especially Americans are very used to this idea of dividends that stay the same or are raised every single year, even if it's a good idea or not. I mean, yeah, we've spoken about businesses that through the pandemic stopped paying a dividend and mm -hmm. we've talked privately and probably on the podcast, if they ever reinstate their dividend, the company, the stock will probably trade back to the dividend yield that it was trading at before. So I could see how some companies would be reluctant to stopping that, even if it makes sense, because they're worried about, well, is there just going to be forced selling by indexes and ETFs, things yeah. that specifically buy dividend paying stocks because that fits within that mandate. Um, I think, unfortunately, better, worse, whatever, probably worse. That's probably what some of those companies are thinking about, you know? Yeah, but yeah I agree. I think special, I think special dividends, similar how do most people would run a private business, right? A special dividend, a distribution, whatever it is. Um, that would probably make the most sense, but the market's like predictability, Jeff, right? Go back to junk mm -hmm. to gold. He talked about that, that he learned, uh, the markets would rather you have a stable 6% than a lumpy 8% over time. Mm -hmm. You know, they like the predictability. They like to model it out. Um, yeah. Do you have any other thoughts on special dividends? You don't see it too much. I mean, banking you do, mm -hmm. but outside of banking, you never really see it as much. Well, banks and insurance companies are very aware of how much capital they need in their correct capital levels and will even talk about that. Other companies aren't. So other companies wouldn't say we have to return this to you because we have too much capital. It makes sense. We talked about this with like Encore Wire or like Amar Precious Metals or something. Friedman Industries bought stuff when they had a huge boom. But some of the others have bought back their stock, which is fine. It's a way to do it. And your stock could be expensive then at the time though. So instead you could say, look, we're paying out a special dividend. Either way, what you're saying is, look, we made a ton of money during COVID. It's an unusual thing. And we either have to find out something that we always wanted to do that we can do with it, or we could pay it out in a big dividend or we could buy back our stock. It also makes it seem like you have more faith in your company and stuff if you buy back your stock. When does a company ever say our stock isn't cheap, you know? But mm -hmm. realistically, it's cheap sometimes. It's not as cheap other times, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Next question. Company with two different subsidiaries. One is the cash cow with no growth potential. The other is an above average business with good potential to grow if given capital. Use the cash cow to fund growing business over time. Sell cash cow and jumpstart the growth company faster or question mark. Um, okay. Read the second half of that to me back slowly. Use the cash cow to fund growing business over time sell cash cow and jumpstart the growth company faster or question mark basically or what right so, so it dep it depends on the environment as of today normally the answer i think would be borrow right if you have a cash cow let's think about earnings asset equivalents if we have a cash cow we can raise money from that there's no reason why we have to actually wait to reap the benefits of that cash cow to fund something else now we can instead find someone else who will finance that, give us the money up front, and we can pay that down over time, especially public companies. So that will be shielded with dividends and stuff. So if you get fixed in longer term and everything, that can make a lot of sense. Even today, you're usually going to get a lower cost for, for everything except the very smallest public companies. You're going to have a lower cost of capital right now um, on, on borrowed money than you are on your stock, really. Um, it's still the case that if you have smart things to do, you can borrow money at prices that after taxes are less than the smart things that you can do. So, you know, you might be able to borrow six times what that cash cow is producing in free cash flow each year and use that immediately to jumpstart that growth business if it has good returns on capital. It's similar to how we talked about with Cap Cities, right? They would take three years to pay down the debt. They didn't wait to build up the cash before buying something new. They bought something with debt and then they paid it down. Mm-hmm. Opinion on leveraged recaps, i.e. buybacks or dividends with debt. So this is an interesting one. I This is one where I have mixed feelings, usually the opposite. I don't like the idea that a certain level of leverage is just smart in general. 
you know, it matters what price you're paying to buy the stock at. So I want to do it just to load up on debt again. But I think we talked about this with the company that controlled Weight Watchers, for instance, that was their attitude really is that look, the stock price is the stock price. We need to bring the leverage back up to five or six times or whatever when it gets down to nothing. That's a private equity way of thinking sometimes when they control a public company. There's nothing wrong with it if you time it right, but you have to time the liability stuff and the asset stuff at the right time, right? It's like even if people gave you money at almost nothing, if you could only reinvest it at mortgages at 2%, you probably don't want to do it. You know, it's what we talked mm -hmm. about with the Buffett thing. You want both sides to work out. And my only concern is, yeah, that makes sense to up the liability side that way. But what if you're financing a purchase of stock that isn't that cheap, right? Mm -hmm. You could just pay out a big giant dividend. So mm -hmm. that's the other option. Next question. A question I have often asked is when should a company use surplus cash flows, truly surplus, for buying shares of, a, of another company with all its risks, i.e. acquisitions, versus buying shares of your company that you know best, i.e. buybacks? Answer, well, maybe it depends. Kind of is similar to Rick's, right? What we were just yeah. talking about, right? So they buy other uh companies in their industry and what they do, but they also buy back their stock as well. And he, I think, communicates when it's a 10 or 12% free cash flow, you know, whatever that number is, maybe it's 15, I don't know. Um, then they're going to do that. But uh, it's a great question. So when should you buy another business versus just buying back your own stock, which you know, through and through? I think it depends on your biases. Buffett buying back his own stock would be a really strong sign. Because Buffett, I don't know, now we're maybe four decades ago or something, bought shares in Safeco and said Safeco has a better insurance operation than we do at Berkshire. Um, if they could be that smart, if Microsoft could say, well, we're buying Activision because Activision has a better um, video game publishing business than we do, then maybe it makes a lot of sense to buy someone else, right? But it's the question of what your bias is. I think most biases today is way biased towards buying back your own stock. They always say that they see it as a show of confidence in themselves and their management team, you know, in their management team and then the business and all of that. And um, so some have a bias and some grow things to buying other things, but I would say be careful about what biases there are and adjust for that fact. Um, so be aware of your own biases and what it has to meet the threshold. Um, you know, Buffett is usually eager to buy something else, not buy back his own stock. So when he buys back its own stock, it's probably a really big deal. But there are lots of other companies that just want to buy back their own stock all the time because they think it shows a lot of confidence or they do have a lot of confidence or whatever it might be. They think they're the best. Andrew, you guys are in Dallas. Have you guys ever looked at Fort Worth based FCFS? It's got compounder numbers and seems indifferent to the cycle trading at, at a historical low for multiple. What do you think of their capital allocation? FCFS. First Cash Inc. So Here, this is First Cash company. Financial Services, I think it used to be called. Let's see. Mm. First Cash Holdings Inc. was incorporated in 1988. It's headquartered in Fort Worth. Uh, yeah, retail pawn stores. Yeah, yeah. so you're right about that. You ever looked at this um, company? Yeah, I knew this company pretty well about 20 years ago. Um, something like that. I don't remember when it was public and exactly when. Um, there were a few pawn shops public at the same time. It was Easy Pawn or something like that. Cash I don't America. Remember. Yeah, so I don't remember always what names they operate under for their stocks versus what they put on their shops, you know? Mm -hmm. But it had been Easy PW and stuff. It said, yeah, Cash America, which is... Um, the name that they use on their actual shops and stuff. Yeah. Um, and then with the ones in Texas and stuff. So, you know, there's different laws in different States. A lot of times the, for those outside the United States to understand this, this is much more a business that would make sense in places like Texas than in much of the um, Northern and uh, part of the country because of um, laws against maximum interest and other things. Um, so, a similarity is obviously going into Mexico too with a lot of them um, since they're already near there and Mexico has less banking and stuff as a bigger population of people who would want that kind of stuff. Um, we can look at some of their capital allocation and stuff at the looks like they're buying back a lot of their stock. 
since 2017. Okay. Mm-hmm. And also paying dividends as well. All right. And acquiring other, I imagine, pawn shops. Okay. Because it says acquisitions there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so what's been happening with their debt levels and stuff if we go to the balance sheet? Imagine it's gone up. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, debt is, I mean, this is as of, we could go to quarterly, uh, September of 2023, debt $1.6 billion, uh, which is, you know, probably more than doubled since 2021. Yeah, it's gone up a big amount. Okay, what are their current assets situation? Um, how much has current assets gone up over the last 10 years? It's uh, gone. F- today, It's we're at $1.2 billion, And in 2000, we we'll go to annually, 2012, uh, 241 million. Yeah, this company's really grown. Okay, so let's take current assets as of 2012 versus total liabilities as of 2012. What was that? Current assets in 2012, 241 million versus total liabilities, 155 million in 2012. Okay, and then let's do 2022. What's the um, total current assets and then the total liabilities? Total current assets 2022, 1.1 billion. Total liabilities, 2 billion. Okay. So huge change. They used to be one and a half times or something current assets to total liabilities, very liquid and strong position that way. Now they've uh, reversed that and there's a pretty big gap that way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the stuff that isn't current can't really be liquidated and stuff. So the company is operating under conditions where it has to make money each year and stuff to be able to pay off its debts and everything. Um, so, which is fine, but I think the financial quality of the pawn stores and stuff that I saw, um, and payday loan things and stuff deteriorated a lot over time as a public company over the 20 years or something, they used to be really strong. Um, that's why I mentioned it because I looked at companies like this from like a Ben Graham perspective and they're pretty strong on like current assets to total liabilities. They're really strong compared to other financial services companies that people might realize. Yeah. They're in a kind of business that might be high risk that way, but Financially, they're very strong, but we've even seen that when we talk about CarMart or something, right? Like if you really look at it in terms of the balance sheet, they started securitizing things. The debt would be on the higher end of what they used before. The length of the loans was lengthening out, you know, so it doesn't make it a bad business or anything, but it just means that um, the balance sheet strength was becoming less and less extremely um, strong compared to other kinds of financial services things. So. Um, that doesn't mean the capital allocation is bad. In fact, a lot of people like capital allocation like that, where you buy back a lot of things and have a lot of growth that way. But certainly you've weakened your financial position over time. Um, so if we look at the overview, we can see the growth rates, right? Mm-hmm. So we do have strong growth rates in free cash flow, right? And it's pretty much mass- matched the growth we've th- seen in other things. It hasn't really exceeded growth in assets and stuff, but it's been good. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's mostly what people want to see when you say EBITDA on free cash flow seems to be the things that people value. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it's interesting because I just read something that was by um, Inside Arbitrage, I think, but it reminded me of something, which is that he was one of the few people who looked at the balance sheet of Paramount versus the balance sheet of um, Warner Brothers Discovery. And I do notice that people just use like EV to EBITDA, not looking at things like how much production have they already paid for and is sitting in inventory and how much is um, receivables due them and everything. Anyway, they, you don't get credit for it. Like if you're a movie studio or something, no one's looking at your balance sheet and giving you credit for it. Maybe Buffett is, Gabelli is, people like that. But the analysts and the media and stuff are just doing like enterprise value to EBITDA. The point of that is like Warner Brothers Discoveries is quite a bit weaker than people might realize and Paramount's a bit stronger than people might realize. And um, I think that is indicative of today. That a lot of times it, it, maximizing EBITDA and free cash flow versus stated enterprise value and stuff doesn't is what gets you the most credit. We talked about that with Encore Wire. They had receivables that people weren't counting as if they were going to be cash, but receivables become cash. But a computer doesn't use it in the calculation of enterprise value. So in essence, you could have all the receivables in the world. It doesn't give you any credit till it turns to cash. So I find that fascinating, you know, if you use some ratios that simple. Um that is something that's changed. Analysts of the Ben Graham era paid a lot more attention to the balance sheet. 
like, you know, so what I just pointed out, I'm not even sure people do that calculation. What are current assets versus total liabilities? But having more in current assets than total liabilities makes a company pretty good position to deal with the future and everything. So it's something to check off and see if they have. And, and First Cash did have that a decade ago. Next question. What do you think about buybacks at high valuations? Buffett said buybacks can destroy value if done at the wrong price, but he also praised Apple for doing buybacks, which they seem to do at any valuation. Seems like a contradiction unless you think Apple is always undervalued. That's a good question. I don't know that Apple's been overvalued by a lot. So, and I think Apple's other options are the only other thing it could do is pay dividends. It doesn't have mm -hmm. any other options for anything that would make sense. Um, it's kind of like Buffett, right? Where else is he going to? Mm -hmm put all that capital what else is he gonna do probably makes sense yeah, at some point to do something with it yep apple's bigger than berkshire and more narrowly focused it can't do other things it's never acquired things successfully and integrated them in any way or anything like that so it operates in a very very narrow field so i don't think it could just go out and buy something else so its options are to pay a dividend or to buy back stock mm -hmm. um many of these companies it might make sense if they paid a dividend for a hundred percent of their earnings and stuff but I don't think tech companies want to do that. So yeah, this is fine too. Yeah. Could Jeff talk about a few examples of excellent management team allocators and what made them different than the run of the mill managers? Well, I think common sense, I mean, you know, everything that's in the outsiders and stuff. So I think common sense is the number one thing. Not having a master plan is the number two thing. That is not caring what the market thinks about your thematic and strategic plans and things and doing the thing that is smart. So if Apple's price falls in half, you should like doing buybacks a lot more than if it doubles. And that means that analysts will ask you, well, what changed? Why are you doing this now? And you have to say, well, you know, our stock price is twice as expensive now as it was before. They don't like saying that, you know, if meta stock triples, I don't think they want to say, well, it made a lot of sense before. It doesn't make as much sense now, you know, They'll just be like, well, you know, the market decides that stuff. We don't um, in terms of the price. So I think that a lot of common sense and a willingness to be very flexible in reacting to the environment, the opportunities that you have in front of you are key. Um, and that's the biggest difference. I think that most of the management teams that we see that the capital allocation turns out not to be so good is because they have a playbook and they follow that playbook no matter what throughout all time, not looking at the shifting opportunity um, sets, the risks and the opportunities, yeah. Let's see, what is the best example of capital allocation you've seen in an obscure under $1 billion company? Oh, uh, Canterbury Park. Really? Okay. Oh yeah, I, Canterbury Okay, Park. so that, that is very obscure and we're familiar. Yeah. So maybe explain mm -hmm. that. What are you referring to the joint ventures with the land, an efficient way to do that, to develop it? Yeah. Yeah. Canterbury Park is a small horse racing track originally. So what happened is they were able to buy a horse racing track. Um, some people, well, we won't get into all that part, but like basically it took a horse racing track public. Um, but the real way to finance the horse racing track, which is very break even and stuff was to have a card casino, a card room, basically. Small, but started to make money. There was a poker boom, made a ton of money during the poker boom. Then it shifted. They still kept making money. But if you notice, it shifted from being mostly poker to not being poker, right? So I forget, maybe they the company went public or whatever with the horse track, maybe mid to late 90s, the poker boom being five years later or something that it probably peaked. And then, you know, yeah, you had the financial crisis and everything. So by the time of the financial crisis, they were kind of looking into, okay, well, should we develop things and stuff? But they didn't get very far in that. So I don't know, uh, right before COVID, maybe, um, they actually broke ground, right? How long was it before COVID? Probably, yeah. And so on um, using the rest of the acreage around the property. And um, they have a major road there that connects it to other things in the area. It's, it's near Minneapolis, St. Paul and stuff. And, um, but it's accessible so that the value of the land started to go up a bunch basically, but it's not really all that much developed around there, but it's accessible to people and stuff. So they decided let's put in these big luxury apartments, two big developments of that senior, uh, living stuff. Um, 
and plus um, more of your basic mixed retail um, residential stuff in terms of like you've got restaurants and and all that kind of stuff, entertainment venues, all of that. Um, this required bringing in a new person um, to, you know, hiring a new person to be involved with running that at one of the top levels at the company to be involved with making those decisions. It involved um, financing with the city. Right. So not just working with the city for planning stuff, but also financing to get the lowest costs of capital. Um, it involved making smart decisions in terms of taxes, because anything that you'd be doing, if you just sold it outright, which is what the market would like you to do is just sell it and give it to us. But then you'd be paying astronomical amounts in terms of taxes. So instead, you want to do things like swaps that you swap land. So they, they would do that. They would do things where they would swap land as their only contribution to a partnership. Like they'd say, here, you got these 20 acres or whatever of land and you give us X percent of the partnership. Um, but that complicates things because like they're involved now as equity partners in a few things. But one of them is like apartment buildings, which will just show losses from an income perspective flowing through to them. But on a somewhat shielded from taxes, cash flow perspective, you know, an after tax cash flow perspective, once those are, are occupied and stuff will be very good. So they did all the things that you would want them to do. They didn't do the things that Buffett complained about um, Cadbury doing um, with, you know, um, with, uh, um, I mean, I should say with um, Mondelez and with all that stuff. So um, you know, selling off the pizza thing to Nestle and all that. Or like I complained about with the Cunal Land Association, nothing wrong with the seller doing it, but the buyer was just eating taxes. So that's the thing that the these companies don't do is they don't forego the things you can report now and report saying, oh, well, if it wasn't for taxes and stuff, it wouldn't be a problem. They actually said, well, how do we maximize the after tax uh, cash value of what you get over time? And so every way in which they financed it, what they contributed, how they developed it was really thinking like an owner. And so there were just signs very early in that that got me excited about that, of how they structured things. So, um, But it's really hard to communicate to people. And who wants to buy something that's half uh, a high free cash flow card casino thing, but nothing else with that. And then there's other things that are more middle of the road at best in terms of the other things, which might report some earnings sometimes, but might not other times. So basically people would be attracted because you have a high free cash flow card casino, which covers or more than covers the, you know, horse racing and stuff like that you have and food and beverage, but people who are into the land development aspect of it, who are, who just want to own apartment buildings and things. I mean, if you looked at what their share was, so like if you took what the business is, and you divide it by like units of the apartments, right? So they don't control it. But let's say that they own 20% or something of the partnership. Okay, so you say, all right, let's divide the total size of these apartments by five. And then say if that was listed, something like Clark's new value or whatever would be like, oh, wow, look at the sum of the parts. This is a really valuable thing because they have because apartments trade at crazy valuations in, in the market sometimes when you list those kinds of things. And yet that's like kind of a hidden thing inside of this company as it's doing this other stuff. So it also, it doesn't get credit for the tax receivable thing. I mean, we've talked about this again with the calculating the enterprise value. The enterprise value on Canterbury Park is not correctly calculated because if they went out and bought a security and booked it, like a municipal bond and booked it, uh, if it traded enough and stuff, as a cash equivalent, basically. So let's say they bought like, you know, um, treasuries or something. It would get covered in um, calculations by computers and things for websites as if it was cash, right? You know what I mean? So like Berkshire gets covered as if it's cash because mm -hmm. it's portfolio. Mm -hmm. But here, if the company has a promise that they're going to get payback money and stuff over time as an asset, um, it doesn't get counted. Now, you could say, okay, well, there's a legitimate reason for that, which is that that is only a ta incremental tax thing that happens if the project generates taxes. But they built the stuff. You can go there and see it actually was built. So it's going to get it. It's not like the one that happened with the um, NASCAR track where they shut down the track. And so it wasn't, you know, um, it will get paid off. And so basically it's like that doesn't get counted. Right. But it was a smart way to do it. And yet you don't care that much that the investing public can't see what you're doing. So of a really small company, that's the smartest that I've seen. They did everything the way that you would step by step and all the things that investor relations would have told you, you can't do this because it's too hard to explain to people. Communicate. It's going to confuse. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah, it doesn't do anything for your stock, but it does. Um, it's smart to do if you really own the business. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Uh, what are some red flags to look out for? For example, issuing debt to pay dividends, et cetera, bad acquisitions, empire building. Also, can you talk about Canada's proposed tax on share buybacks? I cannot talk about Canada's proposed tax on share buybacks. <laughs> I don't know Canada that well, and I don't even know that much about the tax in the Have United you been there? States. I've never been to Canada. Yeah. That's... Which is funny because I spent many times and years, like an hour from Canada, never cross over. This year will be the first time I go to Mexico. Same thing. I've been really close in the Jeff is Mexico. In Texas. Was yeah, this Cabo so... Jeff or is this Cancun Jeff? Where are you going? Uh this is a second because that happens to be where the cruise ship stops. Oh, so okay. It will be very yeah. good. Sometimes oh, I forget cool. what Caribbean countries I've seen because I stepped off of them. Yeah, moment. you're like technically yeah. I've been there, but <laughs> yeah. haven't really. Nice. Well, yeah, cool. it's like when someone says I've been to Colorado, I've been to the Denver airport or something. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, um. So yeah, what are some red so, flags? To look out for. Yeah. Um. So that's a really good question. Uh. I mean, look, we actually did a podcast once, right? that I said, scrap the podcast after we recorded it. Don't put it out, right? Is that true? Do you remember uh, this or not? You uh, we've, done this. That if, we've done this a few times. Only we've a couple times, times, though. Yeah. Sp on specific companies, basically. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. okay. So we talked yeah. about a company that... All right. Um, so we talk, in that one, we talked about a couple companies where we said, look, they paid management to go away basically yeah right there was okay. a couple situations where they paid management to go away yeah so obviously look if the company pays you to leave the company like please stop being associated with the company after many years and stuff those situations were ones where they were doing bad things we also talked about some where they're they're sort of value traps right because we've talked about this off the air where you say well how can that be and stuff it's a 20 dollars bill that no one will pick up right but it's because the person with voting control is doing stuff that's really bad um, not that they're doing things that are illegal and stuff, but they're taking money from good returning businesses and, and just acquiring lots of other stuff with them. And one day what's odd about those businesses is they do get so cheap in the market that one day they'll probably be okay. E even in th cases of some like fraud, like, you know, I didn't want to talk about ongoing, really small businesses for a lot of reasons. I don't want to bring to light individual people who think they're private citizens and stuff and shouldn't have that mentioned, but we'll mention Tyco, right? It's Kozlowski and all that. So, you know, they did still, the, the businesses they were acquiring were real businesses. So eventually when that really falls apart and everything, there is leftover real businesses that have a real thing to them. Um, so it can still work out okay. But the red flags are, well, there's a lot of red flags. Uh, worrying about how it pre it's presented over the substance of it. So take the Canterbury Park one and reverse it that way. That's kind of a red flag, I would say. Um, Meaning Canterbury Park, the way that they completely, invest relations would have said, you probably don't want to do this because of the communication. They said, no, this is best for the company. We're going to do this. Yeah. yeah. The, the simple thing is think common sense and think like an owner. The reverse is when you don't think common sense and don't think like an owner. And especially when you're kind of saying things that don't make sense to people, which is the one that you get worried about, because sometimes you don't know if they're just putting out that kind of um, stuff because they think it sells well in the market and stuff. And that's what investor relations said to do or more frightening. Do they believe some of this stuff? So in the case of like we've talked about with energy, right, there's a bunch of energy deals that have been share swap deals. That's all that they are. They won't admit that in public they won't say we're swapping some of our assets you know so apa um merged with uh, Callum, right so what they give a whole presentation on it but they don't necessarily say we're swapping some egyptian assets for texan assets you know which is all that's happening right so like they they have assets in different places and what the barrels of oil equivalent that is and what's oil versus what's gas and you know that whatever they could talk about that but what the chart should really show is this is what we owned before we're giving away part of that to a new company, to uh, to a company that exists to give, I think Callum will get 20% of the new company or something, or the it's not gonna be a new company, it's gonna be the same company, but there'll be the two of them put together. And they're also assuming Callum's debt. Um, but so 
they don't necessarily they, they say that the news article says you know Callan to be acquired right that kind of thing whereas really it's to be put into something else in which you swap what was a hundred percent Texan assets for a mix of assets which includes other things like Egypt um, and then there's different values on that and all that but there's different geopolitical risk of that there's different price levels at which the those things are efficient and not and um you know, the red flags are that when you get too far into everyone does that, though, in the energy stuff. Right. And that's what investor relation tells them to do. But the question is, do they understand that that is a fiction? Right. No one's acquiring anybody. I don't know what that is. Um, you're swapping some of your assets for their assets. They get one person on the board. You get control of that in this new thing. But do you understand that that has nothing to do with if you took cash and bought these assets? Totally different things. And I stress that with saying that what Occidental is doing, what NACO is doing, buying things, is different than companies that are acquiring for um, shares things in the Permian. Those companies, Occidental and NACO, if you look at it versus their enterprise value and that they're using cash and everything for it, are actually, for better or worse, buying up m more Permian, exposing themselves more to the Permian through doing this by um, using assets that aren't other oil and gas properties that they're giving up. NACO is just saying we're going to buy for cash this stuff here. Occidental, for the most part, they're doing a tiny bit that isn't that. But for the most part, same thing. What they're not doing is saying we're going to swap our southeastern Ohio gas properties for your Texas oil properties or something. You know what I mean? And so if a company in North Dakota says we're going to merge with a company in Texas or a company in Egypt says we're going to merge with a company in Texas, you're giving up some of what you have in those places for what they have. You're just mixing it together and then you're cutting up the pie differently. Um, they're all doing it. There's nothing wrong with that. But the problem that you get into with the red flag thing is when they talk a lot about something that isn't realistically um, candid about what's happening here, because then it can actually get into a situation where they don't understand what they're doing. And that does get worrying. Um, so if they know that they just want a mix that's less Egypt, more Texas, and behind the scenes, that's what they're saying and stuff. There's no problem. And that's what they're really doing. But that's not, I don't, I mean, I read the investor presentation and that's not exactly what it says in the investor presentation. And Callan had merged with something else, getting rid of something and acquiring something. That same sort of thing happened where they said, oh, they, they mentioned the multiples are getting it. It doesn't matter what the multiples are. You sold something at two times EBITDA ought to buy something at two times EBITDA. You could have sold at 20 times EBITDA and bought it 20 times EBITDA. It's the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the two are the same. You know what I mean? Like the mm -hmm. multiple m means absolutely nothing. So it's only a gap between what you sell at and what you buy at that would matter. Y you know, mm -hmm. selling one net net to buy another net net. Oh, I needed to do it because I wanted to buy something so cheap. Well, you sold something so cheap too. So you didn't accomplish anything, you know? Um, so Wasn't this price at $38 a share too, right? The little arbitrage. No, it's, on it's, there? Pr it's priced on the shares though. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's priced on the share. Yeah. So there could be some arbitrage thing in, in this deal, but it is priced as a ratio of the shares. You can look it up. Yeah. I did mention inside arbitrage. That's a good place to look these things up. But what nice. happened is uh, the acquirer the dropped. Yeah. So the acquirer dropped. I, my memory is like, I don't remember anything about the meaningful stuff about differences with the um, price declining of the acquirer being a big deal here. So you're now exposed. If you believe this deal is going through and stuff, you're exposed to the acquirer stock, right? Um, now uh, there are probably material adverse change things and stuff. So if tomorrow, you know, there's a coup in Egypt or something, maybe the deal doesn't have to go through. But other than that, it, it could be changing because of beliefs about the um, acquiring company, right? Because now Callan is a bet on the acquiring company because this is going to be swapped into shares of them. Um, yeah, but I do. Last I checked, yes, there is still a gap. In other words, if you shorted one and along the other, yes. If it closes at what it says, there's there's a spread. Mm -hmm. What are cues of good capital allocation today that are not backward looking? Example, return on invested capital. That are not backward looking. Well, I mean, when I mentioned the Canterbury Park thing, it was that they were going to do it in a way that would minimize taxes, delay taxes, preserve the value of what they were talking about. Um, so there are signals, but I'm trying to think of what could you see in terms of 
on the financials. Um, well, you could see that they're I'm doing not, like a joint venture and mm -hmm. supplying the land. I mean, that's kind of like what St. Joe does. I mean, it shows that they are being more thoughtful in how they're doing it. It's kind of a more of a, even in Canterbury Park's perspective, it's a capital light way to develop it, right? They're just supplying the land. Yeah. So any of those things that we talked about, about thinking like an owner, the things that are not, that don't necessarily look good, but do make sense longer term versus the things that, you know, the reverse is eating the ta taxes, reporting something that looks good now. Um, in general, very high earnings quality is usually good. So if you look at the actual amount, you know, um, that is backward looking, if, you know, depending on how you do that in terms of, yeah, you have to get information from the over time for it. But what you'd like to see, at least comparing it, is an increase in earnings quality in terms of more and more cash being generated relative to reported earnings over time would be nice. Um, often that ticks up before other good things happen for the company. So earnings quality may improve before reported earnings improves when you see change in management teams and stuff. It's one of the quickest things they can change. Arbitraging when your stock is at all-time high PE. So kind of bringing it back to the Henry Singleton uh idea he mm -hmm. didn't ask a question but yes we think i mean i we think that's a great way to use your company if you're thoughtful about it right i mean the worst is when people use their low pe to finance an acquisition yes absolutely yeah but the problem is you have to find something else that has a different one right and that's where people could always argue about it so i don't think anyone's going to be excited if an ai company says we're acquiring an oil company but it's P arbitrage. What do you think about the P arbitrage from private market to public markets, right? So you think private markets, mm -hmm. things trade for three to four times, maybe in the market, your multiple trades at 10 times, 12 times, 15 times, 16 times, 20, whatever it is. What are your thoughts on that That's arbitrage? Really, so it cycles, but right now is a really, really good time for that. Outside of tech type things, venture type things, tech type things is different. But for really mundane businesses, this is a great time for that stuff. Or it was before the interest rates started going up and stuff, certainly. This was a great time that um, private businesses sold for less than the same thing as a public company for the really boring stuff. Um, and that was also the case in a lot of businesses, you know, half a century ago. But then there's an in-between point where that's not true. In the late 70s, early 80s, private businesses probably wouldn't accept offers that value them the same way as public companies in their same industry. They'd say that's too cheap. We won't do it. I mean, certainly in the 74 recession and stuff, I don't think a private ad agency would ever consider an offer that was as bad as ad agency stocks that had gone public were priced at. So I'm just saying it varies. It's not like you can always get a higher price in public markets than uh, private markets. But for boring businesses right now, I think that you can. And so that's a big opportunity is to use stock to roll up something that's really boring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to judge a CEO's allocation track record? Yeah, that's hard. Um, it depends on the company. Some companies, they allocate a lot of capital very rapidly. And some companies, it takes a very long time to allocate a lot of capital. Buffett talked about that in one of his letters, I think. Um, so it would depend how much is decided up at management, uh, at corporate, and how much time they had. Someone like Tim Cook, it would be pretty fast because Apple had a lot of cash. They didn't know how to use the cash anywhere except up at corporate. So the decisions had to be made pretty fast up there. But, um, you know, if you took over Kroger tomorrow, it might take a while, actually. There's things that are already in the works and lots of stuff that can be used before it goes to HQ. So you allocate a fairly low amount of the capital over three or four or five years as compared to how much you end up allocating at Apple. There's less discretionary cash flow. And then he asks two more. Elaborate on, on how a company can reinvest earnings within the business. And shouldn't the optimal allocation depend on whether the company is growing, stable, or shrinking? Well, I mean, we can do the formula for you. Theoretically, not necessarily. Um, so whether it's growing stable or shrinking can only matter to the extent that it deviates from the return on invested capital, um, that the, the opportunity cost, basically. So the next best alternative, let's say paying out the dividend to you. Actually, there has to be a point where formulaically it intersects such that 
um, it would not matter if you retained 0% or 100%. Um, if we take that as being 9% or something as the after-tax cash return, um, at which people that you give money out to your shareholders, they could then reinvest in the stock market and get 9% a year forever. If that's the number, then as you approach 9%, um, it, it becomes less and less important uh, how what you do on either side. So as you approach 9% by being on the 8% side or at the 10% side, as you approach that number, whatever it is, uh, it becomes very unimportant whether the company is growing, shrinking, or, or staying the same. As you get far away from that, it blows out and becomes extremely important. So if your return is that you could have 20, 30, 40%, then it becomes very important how much you do. It's also true on the other side. So it's relatively unimportant whether a company is reinvesting everything or paying out everything in dividends if the returns are of the very high single digits. But if the returns are very close to zero, you want it all paid out in dividends. Um, so I've pointed that out before with some companies where I say it doesn't really matter that much. People make a big deal about... Um, like, well, that's kind of in that neighborhood of ones we talk about all the time. It's not perfectly in that neighborhood, but is something like Virtu. Um, but there's also some supermarket ones that are awfully close and stuff. Truthfully, it doesn't matter that much. Um, their likely returns uh, averaged out if you take three years or something. You know, they're cyclical, so it might look good for a little while and then bad. Um, but on an on leverage basis and stuff, it's often pretty similar to that. So it doesn't really matter that much. Um, it's a formula where it's the amount of reinvestment you make and the rate of that reinvestment where you have to subtract out the um, opportunity cost, basically the alternative that you have. So what that means is you're putting a hundred million dollars to work. What you're doing is it's a hundred million dollars at this number. We'll call it nine. Uh, at this number that you can reinvest in, we'll call it X or whatever, minus nine. So if it's nine and nine, then it doesn't matter. If it's 10 and nine, it matters very little, right? If it's 20 and nine, then the difference in reinvesting 100 million versus 50 million or something is as big as the difference that you have in the rate difference of like 20 versus nine, you know? Um, so it that's just... I think can be overlooked that way. It it's only matters as you get far away from the the normal returns that you would have elsewhere in the economy. And I would say that the returns generally that you get in things like car dealerships, like your average bank and stuff are awfully close to the returns you get in the rest of the economy. So it doesn't much matter if it's in the hands of the company or in the hands of the shareholders. So it doesn't much matter if they reinvest a ton or not if they keep doing it at the same rate. Now, if their opportunity set is much better in the future or it's getting much worse, then that's a totally different story, right? Because it's the incremental stuff that matters. But I actually don't think that it matters as much as people might think about whether they're growing, shrinking, or staying the same. It only matters for quite bad businesses, which is rarer because they could revert, and very good businesses, um, which could be more likely just because it could be something that's totally unique to the company is why it's a very good business, you know? Um so, but as you approach a normal return, it shouldn't matter. Like, you know, for example, if someone said, oh, the S&P 500 is worth more or less because it's going to reinvest a lot. No, it shouldn't matter to your calculations of what the long-term returns are in the S&P 500 if it reinvests a lot or not, because it doesn't make sense that the returns that companies in the S&P could get could be much different than returns that are generally available in the economy. So it shouldn't really matter, like as a group. It could totally matter a huge amount if Meta chooses to do it or not, or if U.S. Steel chooses to do it or not. But I just don't see how a group of 500 companies, it can matter much one way or the other what their dividend policy is versus their reinvestment policy. Mm -hmm. They will get an average result on average in a group that big. How would you design an incentive structure to ensure alignment of interest between shareholders and management in the context of capital allocation? Can you share a real life example currently? Hmm. A real life example. What do you think about that one? Do you have any idea of a real life example of an incentive structure between a management team? I don't know if this is gonna. What does a big Lari Holdings have something like that? Mm -hmm. How is that set up? Can you uh, refresh my memory on that? Like a he hedge fund with a corporate corporation with though. the book value. Yeah, with the book value. Yeah, and he gets like a percentage of it. Is that how it is? 
Mm-hmm, I believe, unless it's different than I remember over the hurdle rate. So it's very similar to like the Buffett partnership, but with a. Uh, uh... Mm-hmm. Don't doesn't he also invest the company's cash in like the fund or something like that as well? Sort of, yeah. It's quite complicated now, but so he was running a hedge fund and running the company at the same time, and then over time, what's happened is they've bought back the company's bought back stock in itself. And the importance of the hedge fund independent of the company has shrunk a lot. So they break it out, explaining it in the um, filings and stuff now that you can see. But what's happened is that it used to be that um, the stuff that wasn't the company that was in the hedge fund was once pretty big and now it's not. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that structure? That's the only thing I'm trying to think of. What other incentive as it relates to capital allocation? Yeah, um, you know my thoughts on that. I mean, they're controversial, but he doesn't need to be incentivized in any way. Is it fair or not is a different question. Because they have to negotiate with him to come up with a structure that would be fair, and should he benefit that much and stuff? Yeah, maybe. I mean, did Elon Musk have to be incentivized to work at Tesla? What's yeah. he going to do, leave Tesla? Yeah. Well, he, yeah, I mean... right. His whole ego is wrapped up in it and stuff. Same thing here. I mean, he named the thing Biglari Holdings after himself. I wouldn't be that worried that he needs to be incentivized. Um, so, I mean, it's one of these things. It, I think it makes people feel better if they feel that it's being allocated, if it, it's being divided up, that you're being paid only when we benefit and stuff. But I feel the same way when we talk about our structure and stuff, which is very normal for a hedge fund thing versus managed accounts. We have a fee thing and um, with uh, the hedge fund thing, not that it's very normal. A lot of hedge funds take a management fee. We don't. In the fund. Zero and 15. In the fund. Yeah, it's just zero and 15. But what I remind people of is, look, if we're being honest here, one, we're not trying to get good returns and stuff just because we want to get paid because obviously it's our fund and stuff like we're associated with it and it's our name and everything. So I don't think that if we could make lots of money and do terribly and be in it forever, that we would even do that. It just would be something you wouldn't want to do psychologically. It would be not pleasant in any way. No one wants to, you don't want to get paid millions of dollars to be a 100 hitter in the major leagues. It would get too embarrassing over time and stuff. So um, that's part of it. And then the other part is like, Honestly, even if you just get paid on profits, raising more assets is still a good, very good way to get money. I mean, no matter what any money manager tells you or any corporate CEO tells you and stuff, doubling the size of the company, doubling the size of your fiefdom is a very effective way of getting it paid because they tend to do it based on the scale of what you're doing. Sure. We yeah. get a percentage of the profits, not just like you get $100,000 if you hit this number or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's always incentive to be bigger in yeah. everything now there's strong incentives i think non-financial incentives not to do that because bigger is worse in terms of all sorts of ways of not just in our world of like the difficulty of it but it's just yeah a lot of people would probably say i like to deal with a smaller more manageable thing that way um so i mean i think it's very hard to incentivize the top people at big companies they make so much money that it's hard it would be counterproductive they'd be more likely to leave um, at lower levels of people, I think that, um, being paid in terms of like, we've talked about returns on capital type stuff, improvements versus the prior year or improvements versus a budget that seems realistic in terms of goals they can hit and being paid a percentage of their salary probably works well, but I don't know that paying people a lot different than say 20 to 60% of their salary or something is going to be that helpful. There might be people in private equity things and stuff who want to get really rich over a short period of time. But for a lot of people, pro paying them three times their salary in bonus, it's a recipe for like actually having people disengage with the company and stuff, depending on what the salary is. It, you know, So I think it's easier to incentivize lower level people and stuff than it is to incentivize very high level people at giant companies because we're dealing with sums of money that are almost... Now you can go retire. You have to be in it for other stuff. If you're getting paid $20 million to run a public company, it doesn't take very long before it's like you need other incentives that aren't financial or else why are you doing this? And that, that can't be what really motivates you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it also helps if you have a huge stake in the company as well. 
right? We've talked about RCI on this podcast a lot. He gets paid a mm-hmm. salary, but doesn't he also have like, I don't know, it's market cap, 10% of the company or something like that? I mean, 70, 80 million or something. I'm just oh, yeah. speaking out of turn here. I mean, it's a lot of money. Okay, maybe it's 50 million. I don't know, whatever. Huge sum. 50 times For what share- he's paid annually or whatever. Yeah, you know? right. We can do that simply. If, if the question isn't how do you design incentives and stuff, but instead, how do you know that someone is aligned with your interests? It's having as a shareholder on the outside, you know, if that's the question instead, it would be having a very high ratio of ownership of of value of your stake in the company versus how much you get paid. Yeah, the problem with a lot of them is they'll say I have $3 million in the company, but I get paid a million dollars. So that, you know, so not a problem, right? I have more at stake. But capitalized, if you think you're going to keep making that million dollars for a while, those are you know, it's not like your stake in the company is really all that more valuable to you than you're than getting paid. Um, but yeah, something that makes them less professional, more owner oriented. So owning a lot and not getting paid a lot is what you want to look for. How do you create that, though? Like to create as an incentive? I think that's hard, but you can recognize it as an outside shareholder. Yeah. Yeah. Big owner, small salary. Uh, last question. We may have answered some of these questions already, but how do you judge good capital allocating? Good capital allocators can look wrong or dumb for a long time, and that's the time you want to be buying. Maybe what are some signs you may be dealing with a good capital allocator, uh, like large sporadic buybacks, using stock as currency, special dividend? What else? Last question. Mm-hmm. Well, we can at least tell a few things differently, right? So if you're we can at least tell if you're extraordinarily different, whether it's extraordinarily good or extraordinarily bad. We can start with you do things different than others do. You do things differently than others do. So that's one way. So what was said there is true. You know, big sporadic buybacks, uh, special dividends, um, uh, acquisitions in different fields from what you would normally expect, things that are thematically not in line with other um, things that you do as the business. Even the way that they talk about it, you know, um, with shareholders and all of that, um, if it's very different from what others do, you don't know if it's very good or very bad, but that's a start. Um, and then you kind of have to evaluate the way they talk and everything. Um, I'm a little more inclined than most people to be willing to listen to what they say and read a lot into that as opposed to what they do. I'm not as convinced that you just look at the past record and that's the only way that you can tell. I think there are ways to tell. I think it's very hard for someone to fake a legitimate thought process in public. They can say things people want to hear and all that, but there will be problems with how they give away things about how they think. Um, Like what? Can you give an example? uh, Well... A lot of it will come out in public in terms of um, how they think about the value of their stock, what they're doing, um, the terms that they would use and how they would use those terms when we talk about things like free cash flow, return on capital, all that. It's hard, though, because although I say this, what I'm talking about is finding consistency in the logic of how they think as opposed to using some buzzwords. It's not difficult to teach someone to use words like free cash flow, shareholder value, et cetera. But what will happen is they'll use them in odd ways that are very superficial as opposed to someone who can talk off the cuff freely about those things and um, give examples and stuff in a way that, that shows um, something different from being prepped about it, but something that they really believe and think about that way. So you can tell the difference between Henry Singleton and Warren Buffett and John Malone and people like that, because just of the way that they would talk gives away how they think about things. Um, If we go back to an earlier question, the question about the, does it matter if it's growing, shrinking, or staying the same? See, if you pose that question to someone like Buffett, he has to engage with that question and actually answer it. Now he probably would answer trying to, give a less technical answer than I gave because he's much better at that. But he wouldn't just be able to go, oh, no, growing is good or whatever, you know, like Mm -hmm. or something more generic. He would actually have to engage with and try to think about it. So I think would a a 
a Tom Murphy or a John Malone or um, a Henry Singleton or something, because it's something that they've actually thought about and thought, yeah, is that good or bad? And why does it matter? And what actually drives growth? But your average CEO wouldn't interpret the question the same way. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't start to fire the things in their brain to really think about that. And so they're not really thinking, they haven't thought about what creates value as opposed to just growth. And so they'd be like, well, yeah, growth in a good business is good but a bad business, we want to shrink those or something. They wouldn't engage with it on that kind of level. Mm -hmm. And so there's just things that people can give away um, that way in what they say. Um, you know, so, so take like a Costco or something. What they probably say is like, we want to drive more volume because that creates a cycle where we can then lower prices, which drives more volume with whatever. So they can explain why they're trying to benefit their customers and stuff. If they just said that they're always looking to pass on all their savings to their customers without giving you any of that other stuff, it's more worrying because you don't know what to make of that. It's like a cop That's just something that they too, would right? say. Yeah. yeah. That's just something they would say. Now, they might want to hide in public what they're really saying about how that's more profitable for them by doing that and whatever. But the ability to say that in understanding the formula, you know, we talk about keep performance indicators or like um i think you talked about a flywheel and stuff in um what was it uh good to great or built to last whichever one it was um it's really key for them to understand how they make money or how they create value for shareholders in a sort of formulaic way in terms of like the factors and how they work together mm -hmm. and not just this good this bad yeah mm -hmm. so it the idea of how they interact the variables interact and if you really think about those things, you can't not talk about them. You, you, the way your brain works, you wouldn't be able to just talk in terms of buzzwords. Um, so I don't know how else to say other than that. If you've ever seen like, say, someone at the uh, Pentagon or something who's a spokesperson, but they actually worked in the military and they're asked a question, their question actually is a little different than if they hired a PR firm to speak for the military because they can't their brain can't not work by understanding the question in a military context that way. So that's kind of what I mean. Like these people have a financial literacy and stuff to it that they would understand that and it would come through in their response to you. There's just uh -huh. a difference between someone who's been coached to say some buzzwords and someone who's analyzing what you're saying and kind of thinking it through in their brain. Actually understands it, right? Yeah. It, it's just, it's different. And that's what you're really looking for when you're listening to answers and stuff, I think. So I think you can hear that when people talk about it from the beginning. Um, and we don't know that the, uh, under pressure and stuff, they'll actually stick to doing that. There's lots of people who analyze things and want to do it a certain way, but then in the moment aren't going to do it. Um, those are character things that are different than just mentally thinking about it. But it's still different than someone who just says the same things. So, um, yeah. And I would do like print out transcripts or any time that they talk for the longest period of time, highlight things, whatever, try not to just use like investor presentations and things that are prepared by others and put up there and bring out the keywords because it's harder for you. The less and less context you get, the harder it is to understand. And the more that just like the propaganda of what they're trying to communicate to you is going to get through. It's much harder to keep up an act to take the floor and talk for an hour and still seem convincing as opposed to putting out a flyer. Um, yeah, so that's what, you know, other than people's past record, I would actually look to that to just hear how they actually talk and like really break it down what they're saying. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the focused compounding podcast. It's been a while, Jeff, since we've done a podcast over an hour long. Um, mm -hmm. but be on the lookout on X in the future for me to tweet out, uh, topics, uh, that we're going to go over X them out. As I say, for me to X them out. Yeah. But as you see right here, Jeff, like I said, twitter.com is still the name of the URL. So uh, let's see. What happens if we go to x.com? I don't know if I want to show this on the podcast. Let's see. What does it do? Okay. So we go right to, it redirects it right to Twitter. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with you both of us. If you're interested in learning about our money management services, you can reach out to me at andrew at focuscompounding.com. All the information is in the description below. Thank you so much for all the support. And we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.